we will open with a pledge allegiance to the flag and I'm going to ask uh, Grant Lifkin to handle that. Okay, place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, may I, have, may I have a motion for adoption of the agenda? No move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, let's see, we have room for public comments here um, and perhaps members of the public would prefer to speak after the staff presentation. Does that make some sense? We, we should follow the agenda, I think, Francine. Okay, you want the public comments now? Please. Okay. All right, is there anyone? Um, so, uh, if there's anybody in the boardroom, certainly they could um, give Grant or David their yellow cards and go, but we also received, uh, I don't know, seven or eight written comments too that Chuck Lewis can summarize for us. Okay. Okay, I have three uh, community members in the boardroom that are ready to present. Okay. Well, why don't we start with the community members in the boardroom? Thank you for your time today. I um, just want to introduce myself. My name is Margot Schrank, and I have a son in the local Foothill community. He's a 16-year-old, going to be a junior in high school. Um, two days ago, I wrote on my Facebook page, for the sake of our men their mental health, our kids need school, and they need structure of organized sports. Without either, we will be discussing the big increase in alcohol abuse, drug abuse, gaming addiction, depression, and anger management issues, just to name a few. When I wrote those words in a Facebook post, it never occurred to me that within 24 hours, I would, would receive word that a child from one of our local high schools would choose to take, to take his own life, highlighting the mental health issues that I have been so concerned about. To say this is a tragedy is an understatement. I would argue that this young adolescent is also a victim of COVID-19, just not the kind of victim we are all talking about. Like I said, my son is a junior in high, in high school. When the lockdown began in March, he set several goals for himself. He was going to finish the semester with a 4.0 GPA, which ironically enough, we had to fight for that too because they didn't want to give grades at all. He was going to work out daily and he was going to find ways to continue training in the sports he plays, football and baseball. To say I was impressed and proud of his discipline is an understatement. He remained focused and committed. By Ju early June, after the school year had ended and no word had come out whether school would continue and sports would start again, I began to notice a marked change in my, son change in my son's demeanor. My normally easygoing son, with a quick smile, was getting progressively more angry. In every conversation with them, you could see the anger bubbling under his skin of the surface exploding into conversations with people in ways that had never had before. We talked about it often. He did not understand where it was coming from. I could not figure out how to control it. The tears that he shed trying to figure this out were heartbreaking as a mother, especially because I knew what the underlying circumstances were. He was having such a problem dealing with the circumstances of the no structure and the no school. I worried that at some point it would bubble over in a situation that might have lasting effects. On June 22nd, my son returned to school for his first football practice. By June 30, 23rd, thankfully, I felt like I had my son back again. There is no question in my mind that the change in my son's demeanor was caused by the lack of structure and daily schedule that comes with school and sports and everything that goes hand in hand with that for these kids. My son is one of the lucky ones. I'm a stay-at-home mom. 
who's usually around. His father is always around, and he has two older sisters that also graduated from Foothill that take a very active interest in his daily life. We talk often and endlessly, touching base with each other to see how each of us are handling the current situation we are living in. What about the kids that aren't so lucky? I heard a number that roughly 20% of the student body at Foothill went dark when we went to online schooling. They did no schoolwork, and when people from the school and PTO reached out to them, they were never able to be contacted. Remember what we're okay with? 20% of our student body can disappear? My mind, that's not okay. Um, I've met some of you before, also, because over the past several years I've volunteered. I, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I, made a mistake. I hold dear to my heart because I'm so impressed by the staff there. And I've met some really incredible kids. Most of those kids aren't there because they're behavioral issues. They're there because they don't have any structure and they don't have a family at home backing them up. What is going to happen to those kids? I would argue that those kids will be lost completely. I feel the world that we are living in a pandemic. I understand that this is not an easy time for teachers and that they many of them feel that like their lives will be put at risk. I would argue that our teachers are part of our essential workers. They are essential to the well-being of an entire generation of kids that are at risk of being lost in the shuffle. You cannot tell me that we can figure out how to keep the children in a safe state. Which, on a side note, my daughter works at a grocery store behind plexiglass and is there 30 days, hours a week and comes home to my family. Um, if you can't tell me that we can't figure out how to keep them safe and we can't figure out how to keep our safe teachers safe at the same time while educating our students and avoiding the mental health issues that are sure to follow if we don't. Our children need to be in school and they need to be in sports for the sake of their mental health and the long-term future of this generation. It is imperative that this happens. At this point, I haven't even mentioned the increase in drug abuse and alcohol abuse that we can expect to see, but I can guarantee you that both of those issues are, right, are happening already. These kids have far too much free time, and if we try to pretend that they're staying home and distancing each from each other anyways, it's not happening. They're not. They're out in the community, so they should at least be in some kind of environment that keeps them on schedule. There is no end inside of to COVID-19 that I can see. So I would say that now is the time to figure out how to get our kids back in school. For the CC, kids 17 and under have 0% chance of dying from COVID. However, there are currently 25 and they actually do for 30. Is that the five minutes? Perhaps we can just ask the speaker to wrap it up. And casualty of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for everyone in line, there is uh, a five minute um, time for each speaker and uh, we would expand it if we could, but we're anticipating a number of speakers, so we probably cannot. Okay. So we should get the next person. President Sento, we have two more speakers. So the next one is coming up now. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Heather Boyd, and I really wasn't planning on speaking today. I was just really here um, to back up Margot and just be some more support. But I, I do just want to say one thing. I, this is my last child going through. Um, he's a rising junior. Um, so typically with the third child, I'm like, peace out. I'm good. But I do want to say um, that just for whatever it's worth, I thought the online learning was a total joke. Um, I know no one was prepared. I understand that I'm not blaming anyone, but just from a mom, it was a half hour a day max and there was no, nothing happening. Um, maybe one teacher um, was, he was able to connect with. I know safety is first and foremost in your minds and I appreciate that and I, I want you to consider. I don't want you to make the safe choice. I just want you to think outside the box um, I know we can keep our teachers and kids safe. Um, if it was my vote, I would I would love them to come back every day. 
I know you have to figure that out, um, and I want you to, but I just don't want the politically correct, easy choice. I want you guys to um, take a lot into consideration that online learning is, is really not the way to go. We've got to figure something else out. Thank you. President Sento, we have one more speaker. Hi, I'm Mary Green, and I'm here to support Marvel as well. And help us out. And um, I just want to say real quick that kids need structure, and they need a schedule, and they need social expectation. I'm um, taking all of this away from them, like Margo said, is going to just increase alcohol and drugs and get too much free time on their hands. And as far as like teaching is essential and also sports are essential. It's something that is like our, our, our just human body needs. And as far as the online, as Heather had mentioned, that was not effective. That, you know, there was no accountability um, the kids were on maybe sometimes 15 to 30 minutes a day. Um, there has to be some kind of accountability as far as the universities do online and they can see the whole classroom, they can see the teacher. If you are planning on having us go back to online in fall, hopefully you're working night and day to have something where the kids are on every day, the teacher is on every day, and everybody is accountable for being at school as they are when they are in classroom. So that is very, very important. Otherwise, if you don't have a plan and structure, we need to go back to class and have the kids be there and have back the structure and learn. Our kids are not learning. The past, what? For instance, the past four months of school, it was a good. And so we need to get those kids back into class they need to learn, and if we're not going to do that, we need to do online, and it has to be to where every child is able to see each other through a Zoom, and the teacher is there live, sitting in the classroom or something, because that's the way it's held at universities, and that's how it was. My, I have a son in college, and that's the way. He has to sit in front of the computer, and it has to have the interaction. We need that, and the kids do need the sports, and they do need <laughs> That's all I have to say is they are interacting with each other every day. We have protests where everyone's interacting every day. You know, they're out at the beaches, whether it's legal or not. So we don't want our kids to become alcoholics and drug addicts. We want them back in school and they need their sports. And there's no reason why they can't have that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. President Sento, that concludes the three community members that we have in the boardroom. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Franklin, uh, it's time for the staff presentation. Uh, I think we're going to summarize some of the written uh, comments that we received. Chuck oh, Lewis will do that for us. Okay. Thank you. So for the folks attending the meeting, the board members have copies of the comments. My job is to read the summaries into the record. So I'm gonna summarize nine comments. The first is from Temri Fisher, and she's encouraging the district to open full time. The second is from Karen Holland, she's a teacher and parent, and she's encouraging the district to open full time. The third is from Christy Hanagayton, hopefully I pronounced that last name well enough. And they're encouraged, she is encouraging the district to offer choice of distance learning or in-person. The fourth is from Kimberly Webster. She's encouraging the district to consider uh, the needs of, of our special needs students in the reopening plan. The fifth is from Maria Darcy and she's encouraging the district to consider the needs of the dual immersion program at Sycamore. The sixth is from Shauna Drum. She's encouraging the district to open full time. The seventh is from Nicole Minto, the district to open full time. 
The eighth is from Margot Schrank. She just spoke and she was encouraging the district to open full time and consider athletics. And the ninth is Melanie Pereira. She's a teacher and parent encouraging the district to open full time. Any comments, Mrs. Sergeant? Thanks, Chuck. So David, um, now we'd be a good time for Chris to be able to share her screen. Chris, go ahead. Thank you, Mrs. Sinto. Good evening, board members, uh, staff, and community, parents. Uh, appreciate everybody tuning in today. Um, what you're going to hear today is a presentation that is basically an executive summary of the reopening plan that the district uh, staff has been working on for the last uh, six weeks or so. Uh, it's a very complicated document. There's a lot of in detailed information in it. And this evening, as I say, uh, it'll just be a summary of that. Following this evening's meeting, after we get uh, comments and uh, feedback from the board, there may be slight tweaks to that document, and then it will be shared with the community. I just want to uh, start us off by talking just a minute about how we got here. You'll recall that in uh, the late 2019, the COVID-19 uh, virus was discovered or started to spread in China and then uh, slowly throughout the world, and maybe even not so slowly. Uh, those areas that were hardest hit by the virus uh, uh, really had catastrophic healthcare scenarios where there were not enough ventilators, hospital beds, emergency rooms, um, ICU beds. And so consequently, as the virus spread, most of the, the world at one time or another has gone into a quarantine and a lockdown. California did that back in March, uh, of course, Tustin Unified closed our doors along with all of the other uh, districts in the county. We did that uh, over the course of our spring break uh, and with only losing a single day of instruction that Monday after the spring break, uh, pivoted to a complete uh, online system for all students. Uh, I'm very proud of the work it took to do that. The folks in Ed Services, the folks in IT, uh, we got devices out to kids and families to make sure families were connected to the internet, either through service providers or hotspots. Uh, just an incredible amount of really hard work, really fast to completely change the delivery of instruction. Having said that, as proud as I am of the work, as the speakers have pointed out, it was insufficient should we uh, go into this next year not able to do in-person schooling. And so we recognize that and have been working, as I said, for about the last six weeks on this reopening plan, understanding that what we did in an emergency in response to the quarantine back in the spring would not be sufficient for the 2021 school year. We got that information both from our teachers uh, as well as parents through surveys and our own observations. Chris, if you can go to the next um, slide. Based on um, that work then, we've put in place uh, these goals through our reopening plan. The first, uh, and the speakers mentioned, we have to maintain the health, wellness, and safety of our entire community. Uh, that is teachers, staff, uh, the parents of both teachers and staff, and uh, take that into account. We don't make the rules up about some of those safety guidelines. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, through this presentation. We, we do find that there are a number of people with scientific or medical experience who are very happy to share their opinions and advice. Uh, it's just that we're not able to take their uh, direct opinions and advice we are required to follow the guidelines that have been uh, passed down from the state and county. Our second goal is to maximize student learning. We know that um, while some teachers did a phenomenal job of engaging kids, not all teachers did. We know while some kids did a phenomenal job of engaging with the instruction, not all students did. And so um, the, the work that we've been doing is an attempt to 
up the game in both of those areas. And our third goal is to support educators and staff because this is still a relatively new experience for most of our teachers and the students. The next slide. So we're committed to um, doing uh, these four things, maintaining a school connection. We know uh, some of the speakers spoke about the social emotional connection with athletics and other ex extracurricular activities and just uh, connecting to friends and teachers. We know that social emotional and mental health uh, support for students and staff is very, very important. We are committed to continuing uh, to support the services for differentiated needs. Uh, our special needs students, students with certain medical and health issues, uh, we understand that one size will not fit all, and therefore there will be choice in our recommended uh, programs going forward. And then finally, we're gonna follow the health guidelines established by Orange County uh, Healthcare Agency and the California Department of Public Health. The presentation we've ordered this evening uh, to cover these five topics, um, we're gonna go in the order of facilities, operations, instruction, technology, and wellness. So uh, each of the cabinet members, or most of them, will play a role in talking about those. And I'm gonna turn it over to them uh, to begin. First with Tony Sorian, talking about the facilities. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so, Business Services has been very busy working on uh, health and safety measures to get schools started, uh, dealing with uh, cleaning protocols, working with our custodial uh, folks, grounds, and MO folks to make sure and ensure that our, our um, sites are clean and ready to go, and there is a process in place to uh, maintain sanitization. Uh, purchasing and, and uh, Business Services has been involved with uh, uh, making purchases of uh, touch-free thermometers, hand washing stations, ionization systems, sanitization wipes and for classrooms, um, face masks, plexiglass, installing that in, in key areas of um, where there's a, a, a number of high traffic areas, uh, desk privacy shields for each um, desk in, in, the, in the district, as well as adjusting our operations and guidance with regards to um, current uh, information and um, direction. In addition, we've been working with Ed Services with regards to signage, in, in making sure that there's signs uh, not only on, on the walls, but on the floor and so forth. And then working with um, Ed Services and, and each of the sites to establish uh, food delivery systems that are healthy, safe, and um, appropriate and ready to go. So overall, we're, we're moving forward in, in our plan to start the school year. So with that. Thank I'll you, Tony. And well, while these facility issues are important, they're probably the most straightforward of all of the parts of the plan that we're gonna discuss. So, um, I appreciate purchasing uh, m and of course, Tony and his um, leadership. The facilities will be ready to accept students uh, on August 13th, we appreciate that. The next is operations. I, I just wanna make a, a brief introductory comment to Chuck, about Chuck Lewis's comments. Um, Orange County Department of Education uh, has developed a attestation form Basically, uh, it's the form that districts have to commit to in order to be able to reopen our school districts. And so uh, most of the things that he's gonna discuss in the operations come right off of that form. So there's not a lot of wiggle room for us. Um, these are things that uh, we will be required to do in order to accept students onto campus. Chuck? David, can you see if Chuck is muted? I'm checking now. Okay, I think you guys can hear me now, correct? Now we can, yes. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. So one of the things that's very, very important for ensuring the safety of both uh, students and staff will be daily screenings. And so what we're looking for in terms of symptoms is a fever of 100.4 100 or higher in the last 24 hours, chills, unexpected fatigue, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, sore throat, cough, 
other flu-like symptoms. Employees must complete a health screening and be symptom-free prior to, to work. And employees who are symptomatic for COVID-19 must stay home and contact personnel. We're also going to ask that families, uh, we're recommending they take temperatures daily before going to school and that any of those symptoms are present. We would not want them to come to school. As Mr. Soria mentioned, there will be um, thermometers available throughout the school to support uh, families who may not have thermometers. So the face coverings and PPE are also a very important part of the approach we're going to do to safety. Students are required to wear face coverings anytime they cannot maintain a six foot social distance. That includes while in the classroom, while waiting to enter campus, while on school grounds, except when eating or drinking, while leaving school, and while on the bus. And there are exceptions, and we'll talk about staff. Exceptions are persons aged two years and under. Uh, these very young children uh, must not wear face coverings. Persons with verified medical conditions, mental health conditions, or disabilities that prevent wearing a face covering. <clears throat> persons who are hearing impaired or communicating with a person who is hearing impaired, where the ability to see the mouth is essential for communication. Staff members will also be required to wear face coverings anytime they cannot maintain a six foot social distancing. And that includes interacting in person with any member of the public, working in any space where food is prepared or packaged for sale or distribution to others, working in or walking through common areas such as hallways, stairways, in a vehicle traveling with others, or in any room or enclosed area where other people are present when unable to physically distance. Social distancing will also be an important part of our approach to, to safety and wellness. So we'll have limited access to campus by visitors, designated traffic flows on campuses. There will be new arrangements in classrooms, limited group activities such as assemblies, awards, athletics, and, and, um, and then limited uh, common spaces such as lounges, coffee rooms, and things like that. So the next slide is what do we do when or if a positive COVID-19 case presents itself within the district. We will follow the Orange County Healthcare Agency guidance. So per the direction of the Orange County Healthcare Agency, the district designee will notify students, staff, and families who have been potentially exposed to a positive COVID-19 to self-monitor for symptoms and to follow state and local guidance if symptoms develop. An exposure is determined to be when an individual has had close contact, and that's defined as closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes. So we'll follow that protocol and do that tracing. We also know that there will be staff members who are at risk. And so we'll work with those staff members who may have medical limitations through what's called the interactive process to determine if a reasonable accommodation can be made in order to allow them to work. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Appreciate it. You can go to the next slide, please. <laughs> that brings us to the instructional program. And uh, you can see that there are three options that we have been pursuing. A traditional option where we reopen school as it was prior to March 17th. A hybrid solution where students spend some time at school in front of a teacher, as well as some time at home <clears throat> online. And then a third option of an online program. Uh, of course, the online program already exists. It's called Tust and Connect. Uh, we generally have about 200 kids enrolled in that over the uh, course of uh, the year. And it's been quite successful and uh, very welcomed by the parents and students who are participating. That option of Tust and Connect will continue <clears throat> to be an option for students. So the distance learning that we were on in the spring will, in the fall, if stu students and parents choose it, move into the Test and Connect model. Under that Test and Connect model, students are doing work at home. Uh, they're meeting with their teachers, uh, sometimes online, but there are optional opportunities for students to come in and meet with small groups of colleagues and the teacher. The traditional, um, we did a quick survey of uh, teachers and parents back right as school was ending, the end of May, 
and um, there was a great deal of interest in returning to school in the fall in a traditional model. Uh, board members were interested in that. The uh, administration was interested in that. Many parents and teachers expressed interest in that. And then um, things changed rather suddenly uh, through the summer. Just to give you some numbers, and this is just the change in a month from June 9th to today, or the latest numbers that I have, I think, are from yesterday, that Orange County cases of COVID went from 195 cases, identified cases on June 9th per day, to yesterday, 1,333. So uh, more than seven times the amount uh, of cases showing up. Um, we give tests to people who have symptoms. Six, uh, one month ago, about 7% of those people tested were positive. The most recent number, 14.9% of people taking the tests are positive. Um, hospitalizations have uh, more than doubled. There were 315 people in the hospital for COVID uh, one month ago. And yesterday there were 679. So it's the spike in the COVID that I think is uh, making the state and many of the counties in the state retract some of our opening moves. I understand that restaurants now can no longer serve food indoors. Uh, the governor's put out his uh, face mask order about a week or two ago. And uh, given the face of all of these challenges, uh, the, the district was forced to take the traditional off of the table because we could not meet the attestations that were required to by the county of guaranteeing social distancing mm -hmm. and some of the other uh, features. So what we're left with is an online option uh, that families will have if uh, they cho so choose and a hybrid option uh, that needs some explanation because it's, it's a little bit more involved. So Maggie Viegas, Dr. Viegas, and Mrs. Matos uh, will uh, explain the hybrid models at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. So presented here for the elementary- You're gonna have to speak up, Maggie. It's very difficult to hear you. So presented here for the elementary schools is the AM PM model. In this model, each teacher's class would be split in half into AM and PM groups. Each half of the class would receive in-person instruction from their teacher for three hours daily, four days a week. When students are not receiving in-person instruction, they would be using the online platform for the remainder of their learning day. On Wednesday, students would meet and would, I'm sorry, would be provided instruction through the online platform and would have Google Meet sessions with their teachers in small groups. Additionally, it would provide teachers with time to interface with their students online and monitor the work being done in the online platform. The elementary committee comprised of teachers and administrators highlighted that this model would provide continuity of instruction for our youngest students, especially in the areas of literacy and math. Families with multiple elementary students would be placed on the same schedule, and we would coordinate with our child care providers to provide fee-based care before and after both the AM and the PM sessions. This model would also enable students to have daily access to meals, including take-home meals for Wednesdays. The model presented here for secondary schools is an alternating day schedule. Students will be in two cohorts, alternating days of instruction in person and online. Half of the student body, cohort A, would attend all periods in person on Mondays and Thursdays, and cohort B would attend in person on Tuesdays and Fridays. The days when they are not receiving instruction in person, students will continue their learning via the online platform. All students will attend all classes according to their regular schedule via Google Meet with teachers on Wednesdays. 
During the online learning days, students will connect with the teacher in an advisory period. This enables every student every day to connect with staff and peers. Nutrition and lunch periods will be staggered by teacher last name. For example, um, teachers with the last name of A through M will release students from 915 to 935, N through Z, 940 to 955. This will allow for social distancing and food services. The secondary committee comprised of teachers and administrators highlighted that this model would provide students with a greater sense of normalcy since they are following a more traditional self schedule. On the screen now is the middle school schedule. And this is now the high school schedule. High schools will follow the same model as the middle schools. The only difference is that students will have a grab and go lunch at dismissal due to their larger student population and social distancing guidelines. Teachers will host virtual office hours to support students and monitor students' online learning progress from 1.50 to 3 o'clock daily. On Wednesdays, all students would be provided instruction through Google Meet sessions with their teacher. Hillview High School is recommending an AMPM model. The staff met to discuss what worked well and where the struggle, struggles were with distance learning during the final quarter of last year. The number one reason why Hillview students struggled during distance learning was not being in a set structured routine and lacking accountability on a daily basis. The AMPM model will require students to physically attend four days a week for two hours and 47 minutes. Wednesdays will follow the same format as the other secondary schools. Similar to the comprehensive high schools, Hillview students would participate in online instruction while not in person. Before we go to special education, I just want to point out a couple of things about both the elementary, middle, and high school programs. Um, we thought it was very, very important that students be in classes with teachers. And so you can see that that's uh, four days a week, face to face. And then you can also see that um, there's some accountability for the kids when they are at home. For example, you're right now looking at the high school hybrid bell schedule. And you can see that on Mondays, the teacher checks in with group B at the end of their day uh, on Monday, even though Monday's a group A day, group B kids do have a check-in period. We thought that that accountability was uh, very important to add. We also have a built-in day on Wednesday for students to use the online um, medium program with their teachers. That's important uh, because we're preparing every teacher and every student for possible closures of either a classroom or an entire school should infections occur. And uh, we're directed to make those closures from the Orange County uh, Health Agency. So I just wanted to point out that there was a great deal of thought um, and uh, also input from teachers uh, into these programs. So I mentioned the, the surveys that we did in May. We resurveyed teachers uh, just at the um, end of June and then brought together uh, groups of teachers to uh, flesh out these programs uh, so that they're as effective as possible. And even though, we should point out, even though the kids are attending school face-to-face -face four days a week, the teachers are working a regular work day at, uh, at their classroom. It's just that they're either seeing kids online or they're seeing kids uh, half of a class on one day and half of the class on the other in the case of secondary or half of the class in the morning and the other half of the class in the afternoon in the case of the elementary. Those, those are pretty complicated slides. And so we have a little bit more presentation to go, but maybe this would be a good point um, to take any board member questions if, if there's any clarification needed. Jonathan? Uh, a question about Test and Connect. With, if they go with completely online with Test and Connect, 
is it specifically through Tust and Connect? Are they disconnected from the school they've been attending? How specifically will that work? Chris, can you answer? This time, um, we're planning on having the student enroll in Tust and Connect for continuity of program. Continuity of program from what they've been doing or? In, in order to stay um, within Test and Connect for the um, entire school year or until restrictions are lifted. What's the restriction or the barriers on, if we're having the students at a school online at least Wednesdays, what is the restriction? Is it a technical issue of not having, having a student be able to be online with the classroom all five days at their school? Instead of Tustin Connect. I'm not sure I understand your question. If if we're let me see if I can rephrase it, at least confuse myself. If <clears throat> if a student's going to I don't know, say Arroyo, mm -hmm. um, and they're on an AM PM schedule, one day a week, Wednesday, they're gonna be on Google News, correct? Yes. Okay. Versus if somebody wants to stay online completely and they go, they sign in up for Tust and Connect, they're not going to be part of Arroyo. They're going to be uh, disconnected. They're going to be part of Tust and Connect. So they have that uh, connection with the classroom and the teachers that they're used to, let's say. How are we making sure that? Um, what they're getting in Tust and Connect is the same thing they would have gotten if they would have gone to the classroom. Tust and Connect will be also be using similar programs um, and online platforms. One of the challenges with leaving the students at Arroyo for, um, with your example, uh, is if we don't have enough students from Arroyo um, uh, looking to do 100% online, then we don't have a teacher to assign. We have to look at class size and balancing out um, with that because we're not, we're not running um, simultaneously um, the programs, if that makes sense. Who will be teaching the Test and Connect side of things? Um, well, right now Test and Connect does have a staff there and as, um, enrollment changes. We imagine we're predicting that some families will want the 100% um, online. We'll go ahead and look at first staff to see who might want to transfer and become part of the Test and Connect um, team. If a student starts with the hybrid model in class for four days a week and decides, family decides they, they want to take them completely online, um, How's that going to work? And if somebody's in Test and Connect and they start, decide they want to shift to the hybrid model, how are we going to handle that? Right now, Jonathan. Right yeah, Jonathan. Um, if I can add something, a couple of things here. Um, the options that parents are going to be asked to make will be the option until conditions change. So um, the process that Chris just described where we have to find out how many families want Test and Connect and then make sure we move enough teachers to Test and Connect to meet that demand um, is a very complex process that we can't do back and forth in, in both directions throughout the school year. So whether a family picks hybrid or whether they pick Test and Connect, they'll be doing that selection until the district determines that conditions have changed and we open a window to make another option. But the, the other thing that I want to point out is Test and Connect, um, students who will be successful there are students who are going to have a lot of support at home. So when you ask how do we make sure they're going to get what they would get if they were with a teacher, that, that's an important uh, question that parents should ask themselves if they choose Test and Connect. And I, I don't think we want to beat around the bush in any way by making it sound as though Test and Connect will be just like being in class. It really isn't. It does require attention and support by parents. 
equally, your experience in uh, Arroyo, let's say, always depends on who your teacher is. And so we recognize that as well, that every teacher offers a, a slightly different experience from the other. I have one last question. Um, and I know David Smith is on, and I want to compliment him and the IT department for just getting people online, students online between the hotspots and the devices. I guess I know we gave out a thousand devices once we, when we went online and hundreds of hotspots. And maybe Lynn can speak more to this. When we were on the uh, Orange County School Boards Association presentation webinar uh, the other day, they talked about SB 98 uh, and the new LCAP acronym, the Learning Continuity Attendance Plan. Do we know anything about that? How are we gonna, <clears throat> I, I, I thought the last figure we heard was that we are down to single digit percentage of students who are still not capable of getting online, maybe 5% or 4%. How are we gonna make sure uh, about this attendance issue? So there's two questions I think in what you just asked. One is a technology question that we're gonna talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. Uh, Chris, you can probably answer the attendance question. Attendance will be taken um, on a daily basis um, through the advisories and through in person. We can also monitor um, with the platform that we're going to be using how um, students are making progress when they're online um, working through their assignments. We can see what percentage um, they've completed um, and how long they were online. Okay, and I don't want to point out IT, I want to say everybody on staff has done a phenomenal job from March on with this whole, whole catastrophic issue. It's something that nobody has ever ventured into before. We're still learning as we go, but the job that everybody's done to date has just been fantastic. Okay, I, I had a couple of questions. Please. Okay. Um, well, one, I'll just ask them both and you can answer them whatever order. Uh, one is, uh, in, the, in our work with the teachers and the survey we got, got, do we believe that we will have, you know, do, do these hybrid models reflect what they want? Will we have enough teachers to, to do this? And my other question is specifically about the advisory times at high schools. If it's only 10 minutes long, and it's, they're supposed to engage and take attendance of what, maybe 75 kids during that time, half of all their students, right? Is that realistic to do in 10 minutes? So the first question um, was about teacher support of these, uh, do, we, do we, what's our reasoning, what's our information about oh. teachers supporting this, these models? Yeah, so, I mentioned that we did a second survey of teachers and one of the questions was whether they might have some condition that would preclude them <clears throat> from participating in a, a hybrid model or a, a traditional model. And so uh, we got some responses, but we're gonna need to flesh that out some more. Um, we'll go through the district and state process for uh, working with people if they have a reason physically why they cannot do um, a regular classroom or a hybrid classroom. We think that the number of those teachers and the number of families that want hybrid or uh, distance learning is going to be pretty darn close. So okay. we're, we're not too worried about that. There might be some people though who we do need to in a hybrid who, who say that they can't do it and then we'll have to work through that state and um, negotiated process with them. The second question about the length of the advisory. Chris, do you want to talk about what happens in advisory? Sure. So advisory is basically the same as homeroom um, back when we were in high school. So each teacher will have um, a group of 30 to 35 students okay. for their advisory. All right. I misunderstood. I thought they were going to be half of all their students that they have. Been, which is was another question is where would a kid go when he's got five or six classes? Okay, one other thing, uh, if I were a teacher, I would feel safer if the school was going to actually test, take everybody's temperature before the student even entered my classroom and do that every day. 
Is that a possibility that we could do that for our teachers? You know, we've looked at that a number of ways, um, and we, we just couldn't find a way that, that we thought it would be uh, doable without creating bottlenecks <clears throat> at the gates <clears throat> to campuses, especially at our large campuses like the high schools and middle schools. Even if you only have half of the students showing up at a, at a middle school, that's going to be about 450 to 600 kids. Okay. And at a high school, it'll be between 1,000 and 1,500 students. Well, That's why we've made the investment into those wall-mounted, no-touch thermometers. The problem with the handheld thermometers, uh, there's a number of problems, but one of them is uh, every time you hand it off, you've got to disinfect it. Uh -huh. okay. And um, uh, there's just logistical issues. So will there be a process for a teacher, if he is concerned about a particular student, to get that concern resolved, to have either have something to take that person's temperature or be able to ask them to go get checked someplace? There will actually be a wall-mounted, hands-free thermometer in every classroom. Okay, so they, can, part of that, the process they can have to go check themselves right then. Yeah. And then if they are 104 or above, ask them to go to the health office. Correct. In fact, instruct them to go to the health office. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. If there aren't any other questions about the models, then um, why don't we advance to the next portion of the slides? I think we're going right. to get an update about special needs. Yes, Francine. Well, Greg, right. I just, um, is there anything? Uh, I think it's important that people really uh, know and understand um, how Tustin Connect works. You know, there's a few questions in the chat about it and whether it could be uh, if there was enormous interest whether it could in fact be enriched or meshed with um, online courses from community colleges and so forth I'm not yes. sure we can answer all that today but I yeah. think it's important that we do answer it and really think about how to have a very robust uh, but extremely robust online program and perhaps more robust than we've had in the past. Um, I know that some of the colleges are doing, they're, they're doing some field trips and cluster meetings and, and kind of enriching the online experience while in a safe way. So um, if there's enormous interest, um, I hope we're able to address making the curriculum uh, broader. And that, those are good points. And we should point out that uh, Tustin Connect, uh, the high school courses are A through G and NCAA Clearinghouse approved. So a student who gets a diploma from High School Connect is fully eligible to go to the university or participate in NCAA athletics. Um, we also have traditionally um, allowed Tustin Connect students to take up to two courses at their uh, home school. So they might take a foreign language or they might play in the band or participate in the, the sports. Um, Chris, do you want to mention um, that process in this particular format? Um, sure. Our high school um, students will, uh, that attend Test and Connect will have the opportunity to um, take the two classes at, the, um, at their home school. How it works is um, during the counseling session that occurs in a student selecting classes, they notify um, the counselor at Tustin Connect and that counselor and the um, comprehensive high school counselor uh, get together and make it happen. So that, that has been one of the strengths of Tustin Connect is it's uh, been very, very flexible. Right. I, I just think it's, it's a really important piece of, of what we offer and we need to offer significant choice and it may be very appropriate for students who are medically fragile. Yeah. Even in I had a question. Yeah, please, James. Okay, can you hear me? Good. Um, I, I just, with respect to these hybrid uh, block schedules for the high school and the middle schools, um, if conditions get better, um, in, in terms of the, the COVID uh, pandemic, if, it, if conditions get better, are we locked into this for the remainder of the year when conditions were better or can this morph into something where there could be more face-to-face uh, -face learning? Because I think we've all expressed that's 
you know, to the degree we can have in-person uh, learning, yes. we want that over anything else. The, the only reason really that we have a hybrid model instead of the traditional is we cannot meet the requirements for the social distancing that have been uh, established by the state and enforced by the county health office. So when those uh, conditions change, whether that means there's a vaccine or the number of new cases dramatically decreases, uh, our intent and our, our hope and desire and plan is to switch to a traditional um, program. <clears throat> right now, uh, we're not able to provide that option uh, because we can't meet the, the social distancing requirements. Greg, I'm, a, I'm con sorry, James, I'm going to ask a question while I'm thinking of it. Yesterday on the <clears throat> Orange County CSBA meeting, Ocean View, Capo, and Irvine all indicated they have one of their models is going to be traditional five days a week back in the classroom. Are they th throwing caution to the wind, so to speak? Or do you, I know you're always up on what everybody else is doing. Do you, do you, are you familiar with what's going on in those three districts? Yeah. Um, this is... <laughs> This has been one of the craziest things most of us have ever participated in, as you, as you mentioned, uh, just historic, uh, unprecedented uh, unknowns. And so sometimes the state guidelines get confused between the California Department of Health, of Public Health, the California Department of Education, WHO, the World Health Organization, the federal CDC, um, they all have recommendations, as well as other groups. Uh, I think one of our um, one of our public commenters mentioned an article that the board has seen uh, by a group of pediatricians, mm -hmm. suggesting that it's better for kids to be in school. Which we all agree that it's better to be in school, but the language uh, on the attestation is that we're providing social distancing. And um, in order to be able for us to provide the social distancing, given the, the class sizes that we have, we have to reduce class sizes by far more than we have the resources to do. We don't have the classrooms or the budget to hire additional teachers to bring classes down to a, a low enough level to meet that six foot social distancing rule. There are some guidelines. I think maybe who is one of the guidelines that says three feet sufficient, but um, that's not what California Department of Public Health and Orange County Health Agency uh, are enforcing. Thank you, because I've gotten, I'm sure the other board members have too, several, a lot of emails um, talking about why are other districts doing this and you know, can't you do this, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on to special needs? Greg, I have a, the, I have a I question. Um, so it, it's clear to me that it, when the COVID numbers go down, like you said, that we will be able to, you know, pretty much turn on a dime and invite people back into the classrooms. <coughs> when you worked with the staff and did the staff survey, are you confident or do you feel like we would have enough teachers um, to go back into the classrooms. I bring this up because I read in the Orange County Register today that the NEA is advocating that their teachers not return to the classroom. And I read a letter that they wrote to Governor Newsom um, saying that they did not feel safe returning to the classroom. So if we deem it's safe, according to California Department of Education and the the local and, and state guidelines that we have to follow. Um, do you feel confident based on your conversations with the teachers that we're gonna have enough teachers that'll return to classrooms as well? <clears throat> I should start by saying uh, we have a wonderful relationship with our teachers and they are awesome. Yeah. Uh, teachers wanna do a good job. They want to uh, see their kids. Um, so, so I think we just need to put it, test and unified in the context that we're, we're working together very well with our teachers association. 
That being said, the state CTA has its agenda that they're working on politically with the governor and the legislators. Um, unless the governor and the legislators do something different, we'll continue to implement the CDPH, California Public Health guidelines. When those guidelines change, we change, and we'll work with staff through that change process. Uh, I don't anticipate that once those guidelines change, people will have concerns because they're not gonna change unless conditions have, have changed. Um, teachers, there are some teachers, uh, and this happens every year, regardless of COVID or not, there are some, some staff members, not just teachers, who develop uh, health issues that keep them from performing the work the way we need the work to be done. And we have a process we go through to resolve that. And so if we're able to get teachers back and the kids all back every day full time, that will be the work. Okay. And a teacher that's unable or unwilling to do that would go through those processes with them. Yeah, okay. I, I think we also, we, we need to be prepared for the opposite as well. It's just, we have a COVID case at one of our schools and we may get calls to close the school or close the district because of some COVID cases that arise in our school. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but it could happen. And I, I know teachers who are just assuming sooner or later I'm going to have to go back to online anyway before I stop this. And so they're already thinking, how do I make my online teaching better than it was in the spring? And I think this thing about the Wednesday, the Wednesday work will give the, every teacher an opportunity to continue to, to do that to the best of their ability, to continue to improve how they do online. Then I think you're exactly right. We're, we're going to have infections of kids and we're going to have infections of staff. And I, I think it's unrealistic to think that that won't happen. And so the online work that we do while we can still coach kids in person about how to do that work, I think are really, really important if we have to close a school or close a classroom for a period of time. I, I just want to say I'm sure that what's, I'm sure that nothing is set in stone in across the county, um, there was, I mean, a headline, the front page of the LA Times today had the chief health officer in LA saying that she didn't think, you know, that she thought the school should be online only. And and there, the Scientific American this morning had an article whose headline was, the, the science and the research are moving faster than the, than the um, CDC, the guidelines. Than the and that's precipitated by scientists. And I heard two from UCI on two different sides of an issue about whether COVID is spread by droplets or, or aerosols. But the, the net of it is that there's still disagreement on issues in the scientific yeah. community. One being, you know, the World Health Organization saying the distance is one meter, which is about three feet, and CDC insisting, and therefore California, that it's six feet which is, that's where the rubber meets the road. Once you have that distance, six feet. Oh, God. I'm sorry, I don't know how to stop that. Um, boy, that's, I'm very sorry, that rings on my computer when I don't mean it to. Um, so Francine, uh, I think anyway, now would be a good time for us to move on. Yeah. Um, I, I, to I was just more trying slides. to say that things, th things are moving very quickly. Oh my gosh. Um, my phone's turned off, but it, it runs on my computer. Um, so uh, anyway, I just think we should be, we have to be nimble because things are not set in stone. We may have a lot of infections and end up online and we have a cure. So yeah. nothing, nothing is permanent these days. And nothing would make us happier than things changing back the other way rapidly and us coming back to full-time instruction. We think that's what's best for kids and um, that's what we're looking forward to. Amy, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about meeting the needs of our special uh, ed students? Be unmuted. Hey, 
Thank you. Um, yes, we, uh, we acknowledge that our students with the most intensive needs who are most at risk probably benefited the least from um, our distance learning and um, had a lot of um, it, were most impacted by the school closure. And so to the extent possible, we really want to bring our um, students who require a, a special day class um, back to school five days a week. Uh, we think that that's really what they need in order to um, make progress in their education. They need a lot of um, individual support, redirection and um, prompting and in-person uh, learning. We do know that there's um, the possibility we'll have some issues with our bus transportation because of the distancing guidelines that we're required to follow. We can um, basically only put about half the number of students on a bus route. And we're limited um, not only by the cost of, of um, special ed transportation, which is quite quite significant, but also just by the number of buses that are available. Even if money wasn't a factor, we would not be able to double our number of routes because those buses just aren't available. But in conversation with our transportation company, it looks like we will be very close to being able to um, provide the transportation that's necessary on our routes. And so we think we can get students back. We also know that um, the guidelines that we're trying to, to get to with regard to class size and distance in the classroom, we are very nearly there anyway with our special day classes. Those are already very small classes. And so we think that um, we can bring those students back. The difference for those teachers will be the Wednesday where the other teachers will need that time to do the preparation for their distance learning and their online courses uh, the special day class teachers will just continue to teach um, our students in person um, because they won't be needing to um, prep these online classes. Uh, the vast majority of our students who are, who are taking a special day class, either for the most of their day or part of their day, they do have um, time in general education, usually PE or an elective or some other courses. And so we um, expect them to follow the schedule of the typical peers. So if those courses are offered um, in person on that day at their school site, then they will um, just attend with their rest of that, that cohort. And if those classes are offered through some online process, um, then they would be, we would facilitate their um, participation in online learning um, from their special day class. Um, and then there's, an, and I want to say the, the students who require a special day class represent a very small percentage of our students with disabilities. The vast majority of our mm -hmm. students with disabilities get specialized academic instruction, either um, pulled out for a small part of their day or pushed into their day. And I think you're probably familiar with the term um, resource specialist or RSP. And so we um, expect those students to follow the schedule of their typical peers. These are students who can access their education with their typical peers, um, provided that they get their services. And our, this, whether a service is pushed into the class or is sometimes provided in a pull-out separate class setting is all determined by a student's IEP. But um, we know it will be a lot of work to figure out the individual schedules of the students receiving these services um, within the framework of a hybrid model because, um, frankly, the, the um, RSP teacher will have less days to interface with those students in a particular week, but, but we think we can, we can meet that need. And, and the fact that some students will um, be doing some online learning on particular days, that may even provide an opportunity for the RSP teacher to reach out and support that student during that time. Uh, and then we also wanted to mention our preschool students. Um, we think that those students will be attending five days a week. It's the plan for our general ed preschool students to attend five days a week. And so um, we, we believe that those students um, can access their education as well. Those are already, again, very small classes. And then I wanted to mention the related services. I, I don't have to read them all to you, but most, most common, we talk about speech or OT or PT. Um, to the extent we can, we wanna provide those services in person. I know our, our um, uh, related service providers did an amazing job during the distance learning time to reach out to families and to provide those services. In many instances, it was like actual services provided as teletherapy. 
And um, if that's necessary that we do that, we know that we've, we've learned to do that and our, and our providers do that well. But uh, again, we'd like to provide as much of those services in person as we possibly can. And I, lastly, I wanted to, to um, let you know that we also serve a good number of um, students who are private school students because of the federal um, private school proportionate share that we are mandated to provide. We do have some private school students coming to receive very limited services um, in our neighborhood schools. And um, we, we think that that can continue as well within this framework of um, having um, a hybrid model and having our related service providers on campus five days a week. I know that was a lot of information quickly. Do, are there any questions about, about what that would look like? One, one question. Um, many students who are in, you know, in general ed classrooms have one-on-one -on -one aids. But many times the reason they have one-on-one -on -one aids would be incompatible with social distancing. Is there any exception to the social distancing for those kinds of aids that are needed by the individual student? So I, I, what, I, what I think you're talking about are students with behavioral needs yes. who need a lot of prompting and redirection. And we know that this will be a, a significant challenge, but we don't think that, um, that we actually think that the aids and that kind of behavioral support will become even more critical now. Um, but keeping in mind the class itself will be much smaller. So um, like I'll just say, for instance, a student with autism may be triggered by a large group with a lot of distractions. Now they will actually be in a much smaller class size because of the social distancing guidelines. And so uh, it's quite possible that there will be less behaviors um, or less um, distractions or less triggers in that smaller class size. Uh, but my, I just was concerned though that our our person, whoever do, was doing that job, may have to be prepared to um, violate the social distance, in essence, to keep that student safe or to keep other students safe in certain circumstances. Right. So we've been reading over and looking at some models of what um, different school districts have done that have already started doing some in-person um, instruction with students with more significant disabilities. And the PPE that um, service providers wear and, and what you're talking about would be our paraprofessionals, I think it's becoming very critical. Okay, got it. We're going to next, uh, Maggie and Chris will talk a little bit about um, the curriculum that we're going to use. And I, I just want to point out that when we were uh, pivoting last spring to online curriculum or online teaching and learning, uh, what we didn't have was the common floor of saying this is the basis and the foundation of what everybody we can count on every student getting this and then teachers can um, customize and add things that they're really good at or that they really like this Florida virtual catalog along with schoology that, that they'll discuss the reason for that is to provide this assurance that regardless of what school or classroom you're in, you have the same uh, foundation of the curriculum uh, across the entire district. So Chris and Maggie, do you wanna talk about it? Yeah, we're just gonna touch base really briefly on, um, as Dr. Franklin said, the online curriculum platforms that we're looking to incorporate this year, um, knowing that we needed a stronger accountability base and more consistency for our students um, we involved elementary and secondary teachers and administrators and staff, um, and we've landed on the learning management system and online supplemental curriculum that will service all of our students, K through 12. Um, Florida Virtual will be the online supplemental curriculum as it supports a, a vast number of courses that are offered um, in TUSD for courses and more specialized programs such as our CTE classes, staff will be utilizing the Project Lead the Way online curriculum. And then we've put together curriculum teacher leaders um, that are developing additional content to also enhance and extend the curriculum really anywhere that it is needed across our um, scope and sequence of all of our classes, um, K-12. So we are looking forward to bringing that platform on board with our teachers through professional development um, in order to ensure that um, all of our teachers at all levels have appropriate training using the new online platforms 
Um, we, as I said, we've already put together teams of teachers at every grade level and every subject area to lead this professional development for us. All teachers will be invited to participate in our virtual summer institute before school starts on August 6th and 7th. That will help to prepare them for the start of the school year using the platforms. And we certainly look forward to supporting our teachers in this way and building a more cohesive online platform that um, our students and teachers can engage in. In the hybrid uh, program, obviously, we'll take some additional technology. And so, Grant, you want to talk about that? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin. Uh, TUSD's IT department has been working in unbelievably hard this summer to prepare for every possible scenario. Uh, with regard to supporting the hybrid model, I will once again ask during registration if families have at-home internet service, and if they don't, we will support them in getting at-home internet through a local internet service provider or by issuing a TUSD hotspot in the event that they don't qualify for support through a telecom. Uh, we have also secured 2,700 additional iPads, which will allow us to be one-to-one -one across grades K through 12 by the time school starts. We envision distribution of those iPads to look similar uh, to what it did when we deployed them back in March, uh, supported, of course, by our IT department and our LMTs. They did an outstanding job. Uh, while all students would need to carry their devices with them to and from school, this means that all students would have a device capable of supporting in-person and online instruction at all times. Teachers would also need uh, considerable support as we move forward in both the technical and instructional realms. IT has recognized that uh, this need and we have created a new help desk position that will be uh, operational before the start of the year. We'll have several webinar and video based PD sessions on our new technologies that are going to be available for teachers. Uh, we also have our ed tech specialists and ed services coordinators ready to support instructional components. Uh, students in the community will be able to receive support through that tech helpline, just like we did at the end of the year. Uh, so I think uh, IT will be in a position to be able to support the hybrid model as we start school. Thank you. So just a couple of uh, maybe some summary points. Um, I want to thank the cabinet members. This is a, a really outstanding uh, senior leadership team that did a wonderful job of taking uh, input from so many people and guidance from so many agencies to balance uh, the health and safety of our students and families and staff with the learning needs of the kids and um, honor the direction that the board has given to us uh, over my nine years in Tustin Unified to provide options for families so that uh, each family has a, a voice uh, in their own students' learning. I, I really think that this plan is going to be um, one that, that meets all of those, those opportunities. We know, um, as it's been mentioned several times, uh, most of us would rather have kids in school every day for the entire school day, but we also know that um, given the constraints, we, we think that this is a very good, very good plan. So with that, Ms. Sinto, if we can entertain other questions uh, or board discussion. Uh. Yeah, I just want to say the, the, in the chat, if there are people in the audience who want to ask a question, that would be a way to do it. Um, we don't actually have public input right at this time, but we could um, just take a peek in the chat to see if there was something we'd be able to address. Mrs. Sinto, it, <clears throat> we can possibly do that. The other thing is whatever goes into the chat will be very helpful to us as we prepare parent and uh, faculty communication. Okay. We'll let so us if there's a question that's here, it'll clearly be asked by others as well. And so we'll make sure and address those in the... Those are saved after the meeting. Yes, we're recording this presentation, so that will also capture the chat room. I just have a couple comments. I am very I'm enthusiastic about a very robust online program for Test and Connect. Uh, because I think there are probably both teachers and students who would prefer that model. Um, I am concerned. I think this hybrid model is the best that could, I recognize all the work that went into it and I think it's 
probably the best we can do given the constraints that we're working under. But I have concerns about hybrid models in general because on the one hand, the teachers are still, you know, there's still all the exposure with the students. Hopefully the social distance mitigates that. Um, and I'm extremely concerned about our working families um, who, you know, need schools open to go back to work. And I'm concerned about kids who don't have the, the structure at home to help them. Um, now, hopefully, again, at least getting in two days a week and one day on a Google, the Wednesday on a Google Meet will help mitigate that. So I think we're doing the best that we can. I do want to focus. Um, I had mentioned that the science is moving faster than the recommendations, and it's, it's absolutely striking. I mean, every day there's either a new study comes out or, um, you know, there's and this issue about airborne particles and circulation is clearly um, gaining a lot of traction. And um, clearly there's more and more evidence that the disease is airborne as opposed to surfaces. And so I'd like to see the school, us address changes to our, um, to our classrooms and you know, perhaps you know, outdoor classrooms. Because like outdoor dining, outdoor classrooms would solve a lot of problems. That requires funding that we don't have. So for my own part, I wish we could do a, re a reboot on the bond measure that we came so close to passing last uh, March uh, at 53.7%, doing better than any other district in Orange County. Because if we had that funding, um, we could be looking at uh, multiple things to, that are expensive, but would help mitigate not just COVID, but any future you know, just disease in general. Um, so it's not limited to being worthwhile for COVID. Um, and outdoor structures, outdoor class, class, you know, we have the space because we've got pretty large campuses. Um, so I, I don't know that there's a <laughs> board support for that, but I just wanted to express that support myself because um, I think there's a lot of structural structures as in to our structures, you know, opening windows. It's all about air circulation. If you look at the examples of the people in Washington or cruise ships or meat packing, it's all places with limited circulation. And so uh, to really be able to address that in a robust way and do it the right way and get the right input um, requires funding. And so I uh, just wanted to put that out there while well, there were people here um, who might be interested. And I, I want to make sure we keep on top of um, as the guidance changes, um, I recently saw, and these are scientific articles, these are articles and things like Scientific American and STAT, and whatever, they, uh, that the scratch and sniff tests are more accurate than temperatures, and I'm not suggesting that we not take temperatures, but that may, that actually, people who have COVID lose their sense of smell, and that is a very common um, way, and it may be, it may turn out to be a better way to, to screen um, and on the health issues that when kids are at school, I think it's so important that we have kids go home if they have any sign, even if they don't have a fever, if they're sneezing or coughing, or we can't have anybody on campus who has any sign that could be COVID. So I think it's going to require a lot higher vigilance than we used to, you know, who used to worry if a kid coughed a little or sneezed, right? You try to have them do it the right way, but you wouldn't send them home. And I'm afraid we have to look at sending kids home without any sign of illness. We're gonna to have to have somebody on each campus with a meaner demeanor that we've had before when it comes to kids with uh, who aren't looking well. So I'll just close to say, please open every window you can <laughs> and get HEPA filters for air conditioning just as a start. Well, and we can utilize our outdoor uh, areas. I mean, there's nothing that, you know, prohibits a teacher from taking their class outside to the, you know, tables or raised planners or, you know, whatever. So I would recommend that we do that when it's um, possible. You know, we're blessed here in California with, um, you know, fairly decent weather year round. And, you know, how I, we don't know how long all of this is going to go on and I would certainly advocate for getting all kids back in all the classrooms as quick as possible. And I know I'm not alone in that thought. Um, but I think there are some things that we can 
do in, in getting kids outside. Um, maybe the teachers rotate, um, you know, and one of the, when students are in class or on campus, one day they're inside and one day they're outside or they rotate between teachers for a period of time or, you know, whatever the curriculum allows that they don't need resources in their, their classroom um, would just be great to, to get everybody outdoors. Cause I agree with Francine, um, you know, about being outdoors and the air circulation and all of that. So. And uh, interestingly to Francine's point, um, when we did our last uh, facilities need study, and we brought community and staff together to talk about uh, what we need most, besides renovating the existing classrooms, it was the additional of outdoor learning spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing just to take kids outside, that's fine, and, and you can do some things out there. It's different though than having space designed for instruction, uh, teaching and learning. The most but, important uh, piece of it, seating. Very, and, very good. And sun, you know, sun, protecting the kids from the sun and then giving them seating, which wouldn't be expensive compared to building class, regular classrooms, but it's not something we can do without a major source of additional funds. Comment. Um, I think we're all, well, I should say all, disappointed that we can't do everyone back five days a week. Um, that's such an incredible preference educationally. I have a concern, and this, I don't expect an answer on this right now, but looking at this as far as when we do go back to school, we know that there's going to, we can't help but know there's going to be a learning gap with the hybrid model and the total online model. There's just no way around it. How big it is is another issue. But when someone completes a grade to go into the next grade, I'm concerned that they won't have the prerequisite background or knowledge to take the next level of courses, especially in high school. Um, if they don't get through all the material or they don't get the in-depth aspect of the material, um, they're going to be behind going into the next grade. And I, I just ask that we take a look at that because um, I, I have no idea how we would address that because that's going to be a domino effect then as far as kids matriculating through high school and being ready for college. And then the other issue to think about is what happens if we have a outbreak at one particular school where, and I don't know what the parameter would be of the benchmark, but we need to close that school down completely. Um, how do we make sure that those students who, whose school is closed are keeping up with the schools that are still open when we have to somehow pivot 500, 600, 900 kids into distance, into testing connect basically overnight. So I, you know, again, we have so many concerns that I, I just don't know how we're gonna deal with all of them, but we'll have to. I think you're right, Jonathan. We're gonna be dealing with uh, learning loss for probably uh, at least a few years to come. Uh, we do have some additional resources that the state and federal governments provided um, specifically for that. Uh, but the, the Ed Services team uh, will be working on, on those plans and we'll share them with you as they're more fully developed. The, the point about school closures, that is the reason, one of the reasons for having even our face-to-face -face kids working on an online platform so that when we have to close a classroom, they'll be familiar and just switch to that online platform every day with the teachers that they're assigned to. So should we have a closure of a classroom or a school for a certain number of days, we do not anticipate moving all of those kids to Tuss and Connect. They would continue with their regular teacher um, and they would do those online lessons with some synchronous face-to-face -face time online with their teacher. I think that you know there's nothing in inherent in online which makes it less rigorous. But what the problem is is uh, you know like college students do just fine for the most part, right? Many of them do uh, who self select for it for the most part. And of course the difference is the high school students and many of these students aren't self selecting for this. They need a lot of support. And I, I really want to emphasize. I think what you said earlier when you talked to somebody about signing up for Test and Connect. 
that they, they, the parent needs to know that student's going to need a lot of support, a lot of management on their part to be able to be successful online, depending on, of course, their maturity, which nobody knows better than the parent. Um, so uh, it, that's, it can be done, but it does take that support. So Francine, with uh, board's approval, this is the plan that we're going to move ahead with and we'll start communicating with staff and parents in the next few days. Can and I, can I um, yeah, James, sorry. I just think that the, um, here, here's the, here's the, we have to be able to try to uh, deal with the issues we can control and everybody knows, I think, uh, in our country, there's a there's a divide over masks, and so you're talking about. I'm assuming masks uh, will be required in the classroom where it's appropriate, um, where there's a closer contact than six feet. So, I would just um, I think we need to be really clear about what the expectations are. Keep it simple, but I I. I um, I just want to avoid conflict over masks. I think we've all experienced that as the state began to open up and some of us, uh, which I did, go, go out to some social events. You, you know, at first you're just trying to figure out, do I need to wear a mask? Do they want me to? Should I? You know, you have all these questions in your head. Um, I went to a, a funeral service that was outdoors and, uh, you know, it just... Uh, there was people that didn't have masks, but yet there were a lot of 70, 80 year old folks at the, at the service. And, you know, that was one where it seemed like it was appropriate. Everybody should wear a mask. So I just think the protocols, um, I think we, we should just really try to, you know, be as clear as possible on whatever these protocols are. Cause I see some, um, this will be a rife area of conflict. Let me piggyback on that because I was thinking about that too. Thanks, James, for bringing it up. I really, really, really hate to turn our teachers into mask police um, and our administrators. I, I see so many, so many issues with that. I just, it's, geez, well. I hate it. Second thing is, um, go ahead, I forgot the sentence. Well, I, but I think the teachers are going to want the students to have masks. I, th I think that if we don't have masks, it's the teacher we're going to lose. And, you know, frankly, if some parent wants to make a political issue out of it, which I don't think politics belong in public education, but unfortunately, we've become a battlefield uh, between the you know, people, who, the pol politicians have chosen us as a battle battlefield. I, I think they need to be told, well, you know, we can teach a class without your student, but we can't teach a class without that teacher. And I do think the teacher protection of our staff does have to be an important consideration as we, we deal with these issues. It's one more argument for outdoor classrooms because outdoors six feet apart, you wouldn't have to require them. And it just... <laughs> Absolutely. One more pitch for my outdoor classroom bond. Yeah. We're talking about the connect, uh, testing connect and um, parents understanding. Can we develop some sort of for lack of a better term, checklist that says if you're considering Tustin Connect, you should you should examine whether you have the following ability at your house. You know, between the parent needs X amount of time with their child, child needs X amount of time on the uh, device, whatever they have. Um, they have just, I'm sure there's a whole checklist of things that, you know, parents ran into when these last couple months that they never, you know, imagined. And so I think the better informed they are when they choose, we don't have people choose Test and Connect and then come back later and say, I didn't realize that it was going to require all this. I don't want to, I don't want my child in, in Test and Connect anymore. Good suggestion. Yeah. Yes. I, I think the parents who spoke, um, who want their kids back in sports and it's another schedule. We don't really, I mean, we started the summer sports and then we're forced, you know, to close it this Friday. It's not, uh, it's just one more area where we're with you, but we just can't do it. And it, it to me, it makes no sense because kids need to be outside and running around and, and exercising and, you know, they don't get COVID. But part of it is there's just so much fear out there, um, which is one of the reasons I've personally paid a lot of attention to uh, the scientists who come out uh, in 
and say that, like the head of the WHO woman who's the head of epidemiology, who just a couple of, like yesterday, said that there's the primary spread is not asymptomatic. That that the primary spread is is um, people with symptoms. Uh, so there's just uh, a lot of fear out there, and I, I think our, our teachers have a lot of concerns, rightly so. The disease is very scary, and it's not that that many people get sick, but the ones who get sick get very sick, many of them, some hospitalized and others for, you know, a month, and with long-term disability as a result of it, some of them, you know, with lung problems and so forth. So it's a very serious disease, and we can't afford to take it lightly. But um, I know the whole board shares the concerns that were expressed um, about sports and getting kids outside. At least we can address the structure part that they asked for, so. Greg, uh, Legacy Magnet Academy. <laughs> um, I guess we're just, it's just gonna have to, it will start off with the hybrid and the. Full speed ahead, yeah. Um, so, um, Francine, I'm sorry, James. Yeah, just uh, uh, you know, I guess what I, I, what I'm saying is what what I think we're all seeing is we're seeing a phenomena where most of the uh, most of the, the larger cities in the U.S. where uh, and I would consider Orange County uh, like a typical urbanized type city. I mean, it doesn't have tall, super tall buildings, but we're we're a very dense area. And uh, all of us, all of these areas throughout the entire United States um, have opened up. Some opened up uh, wider and earlier, such as Texas and Arizona and Florida. And we're, we're seeing, you know, what happened in New, in New York and New Jersey. And, um, and now we're seeing this pop up. And so if we're going to if we're going to do this, we really we really need to be rule followers. We got to set up, uh, you know, and, and really everybody's got to be, be in it together. Um, and we're talking about just the basic stuff. You know, if a classroom has too much confinement in it or its air system doesn't work, we, we just, we nix that classroom. We don't have it. We don't use it. Um, we stay away from close contact with, with, with people. Uh, you know, obviously we can't, uh, you know, we got to keep away from crowd, uh, crowd type situations. And then you go to the basics that we've heard for uh, months and months, you know, wash your hands a lot, uh, don't touch your face. Um, and, uh, and, and basically, you know, when you, when you have to wear a mask, because uh, I just feel like this is such a fragile situation where we're going to go in there and we, any school in California could have an explosion. And, you know, I'm on the record for getting off, the bench and into the field for every kid. I, I've, I've said that for a while now, and I want that to be, but I, I also don't want to screw it up because I think we're seeing that phenomena. So, I mean, we've got to be really serious. Some people, you know, just will have to make sure everybody's um, serious about the basics that we need to do, you know, do what Dr. Fauci would do, you know, and that's, that's I think we just got to keep pushing that, that thing. Otherwise, I'm really, I'm skeptical that we won't have an outbreak somewhere. I, I agree. I think the difference between open and closed is far less important than the difference between people following the guidelines individually and not following. I think if people follow them, then we can continue to open more and more. If people don't follow them, something's going to happen that's going to force it the other way. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that, Lynn. I think you know, all of us have heard from folks that want us to be rule breakers and kind of rebels in this whole look at how we bring kids back to school, but there's nothing to support that. And we do have people that are offering us guidelines that we have to follow. Um, and as unfortunate as it is, we do need to follow those because we've got staff to take care of, we've got students to take care of, and all of those people go home to somebody else in their lives that could be impacted by our decisions as well. So I agree with what James says that, you know, we, we do need to set down some basic rules. We do need to follow them. Um, and maybe, you know, others that, that choose to do the same, this will be behind us sooner rather than later. Yeah, the board members know that I'm in Queens right now, Queens, New York, which uh, was at 
one point the epicenter of the, the health crisis. And they're still very locked down here, even though their numbers are way, way down below California's numbers. But they've, they've stayed the course. And uh, all over town, you see these big billboards and signs, a lot of them homemade. So yeah. new, news flash. It's like new, yeah, it says New York <laughs> strong. Hashtag New York strong. And, and the head of the just stay the course. Um, the head of the CDC just now in an interview said that they're not changing their guidelines. They're going to issue more clarity that will address the role of parents and the importance of facial covering in schools. So uh, even though I've been rooting for the uh, one meter rule instead of the six feet, I guess they're not going there. So. Well, that is that it is that social distancing rule that it is our number one nemesis as far as being able to be flexible. Yeah. You know, because we can put we can put masks, we can do temperature checks, we can do all kinds of screening, uh, we can um, change the air circulation, but we can't make a build make a building that's wider than it's than it is. Right. That's our problem. And we don't have the fun. We could do, you know, we don't have the funds to double the number of teachers, which would be the nicest solution, but yeah. do two or shifts. classrooms to put them in. Or yeah. Classrooms or, you, know, you could do two shifts if you had double the number of teachers. But. So Francine, I think we're ready to go to closed session. And in closed, we do anticipate a board action um, and a, an administrative okay. appointment. Okay. Okay, so we're adjourning to closed session and we will report out afterward.